Marva Today with Don Rush. In these days of the coronavirus pandemic, many are feeling the stress, particularly with the prospect of the new variant that could prolong the outbreak. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. For many during this time, it has been a moment to reevaluate what is important in life. Shaw Gottlieb, an MD, is author of a new book entitled, Ah, The Pleasure Book. It is about finding that point at which we can find fulfillment or perhaps happiness. And we have him on the phone this morning. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So I want to start with uh, something that you talk about historically, which is a set of, of cultural beliefs, much influenced by St. Augustine on the one hand, and, um, and Eastern philosophies. Describe for me the Western approach to what we think of as happiness, particularly in contrast to, uh, to uh, the Eastern portion. Right. Well, our, our notion of happiness in the West, which is, uh, you know, much has been written about uh, in recent years, is uh, it's a little bit uh, lacking in that uh, we're confused about what happiness actually is. Uh, and if you step back and take a wider view, you realize that happiness is really a subset or uh, an emotional experience of pleasure, that actually pleasure is what we're after, that, and pleasure being the feeling good. And there are four basic ways to feel good. One is physical, and that includes, of course, sex, food, uh, creature comforts, uh, which is what most people associate with pleasure. But then there are three more levels. Emotional pleasure is what we call happiness, fun, love. And then mental pleasures, pleasant thoughts that make us feel good, like knowing we have enough money in the bank. And, um, and then there's the fourth and highest level of pleasure, which just turns out to be spiritual. So how does that fit into what, how we look at it from the Western point of view? Well, um, it, the way it fits in, really, is that we are uh, deeply confused about pleasure. But so confused that in our pursuit of it, we often end up in pain and suffering which is a major problem because we are a biologically pleasure-seeking organisms. That, that's not a choice. It's a biological fact. And, and if we're getting lost into pain and suffering in our pursuit of pleasure, that's a major problem. And it's a problem we're all experiencing in our own personal health as well as the health of the planet. So what is it... As we sit oftentimes alone at home, we're now beginning to get out. Um, do you think that people are beginning to reevaluate what is important and particularly in connection with, with pleasure? or and, and what is that connection between meaning and pleasure? Well, absolutely. I mean, there's nothing like uh, facing the prospect of death to uh, sharpen one's attention and uh, get clear about what really is important in life. And as difficult as the lockdown has been for many people, it's also uh, been this opportunity to refocus on what is of value. And, and people have come to realize that, gee, uh, what I thought I was striving for to become happy is actually uh, much closer at hand. It's spending time uh, with people I love doing things that I love, and having this extra time that's not being wasted uh, commuting or uh, going to the office has allowed people to rediscover what actually feels good. So how does that connect then to meaning itself? I mean, do you think that people are reflecting not only on those things that they enjoy, whether it's their family and so on, but the mere meaning of their own lives? I mean, obviously people who are nearing death or have some kind of near-death experience, uh, they certainly will perhaps reevaluate what's important to them, what their meaning is. Does that, does something like this force people to think more and more about the meaning of life itself? Um, what do you think? I, I think you just said it uh, really perfectly that, you know, meaning and purpose is a very important to our human experience. And um, and meaning is is what we actually value. 
that's what gives meaning to one's life. And the refocusing on what we really value and realizing that a lot of what we've been chasing, this idea of success, uh, typically material, um, is really uh, empty and hollow. It doesn't actually satisfy us. So we're somewhat ad- like a- an addict. We go after it, after this false pleasure that doesn't actually fulfill us. What really fulfills us as human beings is relationship with one another. This is the pleasure that we exchange with another human being. It's very simple. It doesn't cost a lot of money. Uh, but it is what deeply satisfies us. And at the end of one's life, what matters is not uh, how big your house is or how much money you have in the bank, but the relationships you have shared with the people you love. I mean, one of the things that has struck me, um, you talk about uh, St. Augustine and original sin and this indulgence and pleasure, then as he sort of pulls back. Some of it actually reminded me of a, actually a book, I actually novel I read by Sister Soldier, the rap artist who talked, there was a phrase in that novel about why is it that uh, everything that feels good is bad for me and everything that's good for, uh, rather, everything that feels good is bad for me and everything that's good feels bad. I mean, it, it seems to me that we, you know, that when we in, endeavor in, in a particular activity, we often find ourselves in some kind of stress, even though at the end of it, I and mean, when we come out on the other side, we may feel pleasure. Right. We, we are, uh, to put it mildly, conflicted about pleasure. So here you have uh, a, an organism that seeks pleasure that is conflicted about the very thing it wants. And uh, this was, you know, uh, written in the Bible, that which I would do, I do not, and that which I would not do, that I do. Um, and that puts us in a double bind, which is, uh, you know, the origin of that double bind can be traced back to St. Augustine and his concept of original sin, which most of us don't really relate to anymore, original sin. We relate to a secular version of it, which is far more insidious. And that I call original inadequacy. That no matter what I do, how much I have, I it's just not enough. In fact, I'm not enough. And that sense of inadequacy, uh, you know, runs the marketplace. Well, I was going to say, in terms of the marketplace, doesn't the marketplace really encourage us to buy more, to get more, and we are bombarded, as a matter of fact, by these messages? Uh, absolutely. So uh, a lot of money is changing hands uh, over our feelings of inadequacy. It's, it's really sad, but it becomes a self-fulfilling uh, cycle, and uh, really we need to break out of it because we're consuming ourselves into oblivion. So in terms of your book, you also talk about a pendulum between pain and pleasure. Talk a little bit about that because it, I, mean, I guess in some ways I referenced it earlier, but this idea that um, you may work at something, it may be somewhat painful, whether it's learning a new skill or doing some work or whatever, but then once the, there is an accomplishment, there is a certain pleasure that's now then being taken that that something has been accomplished, that something that you've done um, has worked. T- tell me a little bit about that pendulum that you yeah, described. Yeah. Well, well, Don, it, it's really, um, it, it, it's, it's worse than all that. <laughs> We we think of pleasure and pain as, okay, let's say they're the twin cardinal coordinates by which we navigate through life. We, we, uh, we go after things that make us feel good. We avoid things that make us feel bad. All right, that's basic biology. We, in lower animals, we call it instinct. And so then we imagine that pleasure and pain are like uh, the north and south poles of a compass, of a magnetic compass. Uh, that they are at opposite ends, okay? Mm-hmm. But it turns out that the opposite of pleasure is not pain. The opposite of pleasure and the opposite of pain are the same thing. The compass analogy does not work. 
pleasure and pain are kissing cousins, which is why oftentimes in pleasurable experiences, pain is very close at hand. Think of uh, people running marathons. You know, they, they stagger across the finish line. They, they look like they're in terrible uh, pain. But if you talk to them, they're describing it as an ecstatic moment. So if our original compass to navigate through life is so confused, no wonder we get lost. So as you look at society at large, where do you think we are? I mean, you've obviously talked about this in terms of as, as individuals, but where do you think we are as a society? Yeah, well, the last chapter of my book, which really everything builds up to, is called Renewable Pleasure for a Sustainable World. And and I take that very seriously, and I'm writing a second book uh, to follow up on that. So if you look at pleasure as a resource, as a natural resource, as important as fresh air and clean water, then you can... Uh, you know, divest it. You can wipe away all these moral concerns and confusions and just look at it as a natural resource that we need in order to live a fulfilling and meaningful life. From that point of view, we start getting some clarity. As a natural resource, where is it found? How is it uh, cultivated? And who controls distribution? So uh, renewable pleasure is my concept of uh, looking at the impact pleasure has on the world. And you can understand very simply that if you walk on the beach, uh, you leave a very small carbon footprint, and you're having a good time. Okay, so that's a pretty renewable pleasure. If you have to fly a 1,000 miles to get to that beach, it's a much larger carbon footprint and much less renewable. That's fairly straightforward. And we can look at all of the pleasures in our lives in terms of what is the impact on the world environmentally. But then there is a deeper understanding of renewable pleasure. And that's the realization that the ultimate pleasure we are all seeking, that we all long for, is human-derived. It's the pleasure we get from another human being and the pleasure we give to another human being. And since we are the source of that pleasure, it is potentially completely renewable. The problem is interposed, we have this belief promulgated in the marketplace that, hey, you have to have the right clothes, the right car, the right house, the right career in order to get that human pleasure. And that's, uh, that's false. It's quite available. We just need to realize it's there. We have the power to make others feel good and vice versa. So when, what do you make of the, the angst that we seem to see, uh, not only in our political discord, obviously, but, uh, but uh, also in our social interaction, which uh, we talk about a country that's uh, sharply divided. Um, people sometimes can't even talk to each other, um, either yes. about politics or even cultural I- issues. What do you make of where we are with that then? Well, from my point of view, uh, all of that seems to me to be a distraction, that we are uh, purposely being distracted into uh, fighting with each other so as not to see the major problem. And the major problem that we all are facing is the huge um, economic disparity between those who have and those who have not. And uh, if you want to understand this very simply, uh, you can just Google uh, 10 chairs, and uh, it's an explanation for uh, grade school kids how the economy works. And you have 10 chairs with 10 people, one person in front of each chair. Each chair represents 10% of the economic wealth. Each person represents 10% of the population. Well, then, you set up the chairs in the classroom, and one person lays down on something like eight and a half chairs with their arm outstretched, and that's the upper uh, 10%. And all the other eight people are crowded on the remaining two chairs. And from that, you understand, oh, yeah, we've got a problem. We're, we're backbiting each other. 
when really the issue is there's enough to go around if uh, the, those who have would be more willing to share. Just briefly, are you optimistic uh, that we will try to get beyond this um, at this point? Um, what's your sense about that? Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I feel uh, pessimistic hmm. about what is likely to happen as we face this uh, Anthropocene uh, evolutionary bottleneck. But I'm also, at the same time, very optimistic about what is possible, that we can change this. And that will be the, the topic of my next book. We've been speaking with Shaw Gottlieb. He's an MD and author of a new book entitled Ah, The Pleasure Book. And uh, we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us this morning. Well, uh, great. I, I would just direct people to my website at drjamd.com to find out more. That's drjamd.com. And you can see the book trailer, take a free assessment, and um, get the monthly pleasure report. There you go. I appreciate again uh, chatting with us. This has been Adele Marva Today. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening. Del Marva Today with Don Rush.